Good afternoon, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here today on this snowy Chicago day for our Lunch and Learn series. My name is Stephanie Hest, class of 1999, representing the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences and the Cornell Club of Chicago, both who graciously supported today's event and it's been my pleasure to work with these two groups to bring this program to life. So thank you to the staff for your support and making this possible. We have 45 minutes together today, this morning or this afternoon, and a lot of inf important information to cover. Our discussion with Dr. Maria Van Kirkhoff will be facilitated by Dr. Scott Bronstein and David Bronstein. I'm thrilled to have multiple generations of our esteemed Cornell community be with us today. Thank you to you, the audience, for your engagement. We've received dozens, probably close to 100 of relevant questions of interesting topics ranging from the spread, um, ranging from current concerns about the COVID-19 mutation to questions about the Olympics. And we'll try to get to as many of them as we can today. Today's event will be recorded. So let's jump into it. Maria, can I ask you to join? There we go. I'm incredibly excited to introduce mm -hmm. my classmate and my dear friend, Dr. Maria Van Kirkhoff. Welcome, Maria. Hi. Maria is joining us today from Geneva, Switzerland at the headquarters of the World Health Organization, where she's the technical lead for the COVID-19 response and head of emerging diseases and zoonosis unit. With a background in high threat pathogens, she specializes in emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases such as Zika, MERS, Ebola, and Marburg. While we are fortunate to have Maria here with us today, as part of her work with WHO, she participates in regular press conferences regarding the COVID-19 um, pandemic. And it's been about over a year that she spent two weeks in China to better understand the COVID-19 outbreak and measures of control. Maria received her bachelor's in science and biological sciences from Cornell in 1999 in 2000, she received an MS in epidemiology from Stanford University School of Medicine. In 2009, she earned her PhD in infectious disease epidemiology from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, where she wrote her thesis on avian flu in Cambodia. In addition to her incredible technical skills, Maria is a full Cornell family with her husband, Neil, class of 99. She's a devoted mother to her two young boys, She's a loyal and compassionate friend, and thank you for being with us here today. Thanks, Stephanie. That's probably one of the nicest introductions I think I've ever had. <laughs> well, I'm so <laughs> happy to have you here. But before we get deeper and hear from your expertise, I wanna start with a Cornell question. So today's January 26th. It's snowing here in Chicago. It's snowing in Ithaca, probably a balmy 30 degrees. The lake is probably frozen. There's probably a blanket of gray skies up, a bit, up ahead. I'm sure if you close your eyes, you can see all these images and re relate to that feeling of being on campus as we all love to learn this and we love this environment and we learn to love it as well. So during your time at Ithaca, if you close your eyes and you think about it, what comes to mind as you think about your connection to Cornell? So Steph, thank you so much for organizing this and for having me on uh, today. It's really an honor and I'm a proud Cornell graduate class of 99. So I'm really thrilled to do this. Um, I think of Cornell often, um, different aspects of Cornell because I think it was the first time I really started to grow up uh, in that sense. Um, the education at Cornell is something that instilled in me a work ethic um, and the quality and caliber of the classes that were incredibly hard um, and challenging, especially as a freshman, you know, coming from, from high school and that protection to, to Cornell. Um, I loved, I think I remember often um, the classes and the ability to ask questions um, and explore and go deeper into so many different topics. I appreciated that you know, many of our best friends, you know, started out in, with certain majors and ended up graduating with totally different majors. There was the, the possibilities at Cornell um, to have high quality education in so many different fields. Um, I remember the science. I remember my summers um, working abroad, um, you know, on, on different aspects in um, Costa Rica and Mexico and Venezuela 
with Eloy Rodriguez um, and looking, working on ethnobotany, a field I had ne never even heard of. Um, and people like Thomas Eisner, you know, opening my eyes to uh, fields that I never knew existed in the bombardier beetle. I mean, there are just so many things I remember. And then I remember my friends. I remember, you know, you and, and our, our girlfriends. Uh, I met my husband at Cornell as well. So in many respects, it's just part of my being, but it was the education. It was the campus, so beautiful. Um, I do not miss eight o'clock classes walking up the slope, not gonna lie. Um, but I just, I, I remember my time at Cornell so fondly and uh, I'm so grateful to have had that opportunity those four years. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing. I think a number of us could definitely also relate to um, not missing the, the trek up live slope on a day like today in the middle yeah. of January. But um, um, so before I do turn it over, Maria, I thought it would also be interesting for you to explain in your own words how the World Health Organization um, really does play a role in the response to the current pandemic. Yeah, so, so I work um, in our health emergencies program um, in, in, in headquarters. Um, WHO has our, our headquarters in Geneva. We have six regional offices around the world and we have 150 or so offices in countries. So there's thousands of us that are working around the world to you know, promote health and keep the world safe and serve the vulnerable. That's our mandate, that's what we do. In the role that I have in our health emergencies program, um, I work on um, epidemic and pandemic diseases uh, or diseases that have the potential to become epidemics and pandemics. And we develop prevention and control programs um, and guidance uh, to help uh, member states and people all over the world detect cases quickly um, and rapidly investigate them and prevent any small events from becoming big and most of the diseases we work on are very small in that sense. They have a spillover, they're zoonotic, um, where they come from animals and into humans. Um, they cause small outbreaks and then they may go away. And some of them have the potential to be pandemics like COVID-19. My role in the pandemic is our health operations lead and our technical lead. And I'm responsible for a team that develops the guidance materials that we issue to member states um, around case detection, um, biological sample collection, clinical management, infection prevention control, um, and uh, coordinates a lot of expertise around the world um, to try to suppress transmission and save lives. That's our goal. Um, so that's sort of a, in a nutshell, um, the, role, the role that I have. It's been quite a different year, um, I think, than all of us expected and quite a challenging year at that. Well, thank you. I as a dear friend, you know, thank you for everything that you that you continue to do and the time that you continue to devote um, to this practice. Um, I know there's lots of questions that we want to get to today, so I won't hold us up. Um, so I'd like to welcome both Dr. Scott Bronstein and David Bronstein to our screen today. Um, Scott was a class of uh, class of '89 and is the current CEO of Marinus Pharmaceuticals. Previously served as the Chief Strategy Officer and COO at Pacera Pharmaceuticals, and prior to joining that, um, worked in financial services at EverPoint Asset Management and J.P. Morgan as a healthcare analyst, managing director in the U.S. equity team, and a portfolio manager for the global healthcare fund responsible for managing investments in pharmaceuticals, biotechnology, and medical device. Devices. Dr. Bronstein began his career practicing at the Summit Medical Group and was an assistant clinical professor at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and Columbia University, University Medical Center. Um, he earned his medical degree from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and a BS from Cornell. And joining Dr. Bronstein and his son, David, a recent graduate of the class of 20, 2021, uh, David majored in health, global health and did research in the lab of entomology. David is currently pursuing his master's in tropical diseases and hopes to continue on a PhD track as well. So Dr. Bronstein, I'll turn it to you and David. Thanks, Stephanie. And um, I'm, I'm very happy to be a part of this webcast today. And I'm certainly going to turn it over to Maria for all the hard work. I'm just going to ask the questions. And I think it'd be great to start um, if you can talk a little bit about your experience going to China soon after this pandemic began. What was that experience like? And, and, and how do you think things are changing there since uh, 
China has now openly talked about uh, their role early days in the pandemic. Yeah, so Scott, nice to meet you and um, thanks, for, uh, thanks for asking the questions. It's always a pleasure to have an opportunity to have a chat about this. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's really interesting a year into this, um, there's been a lot of reflection on the early days. Um, for the life of me, I can't believe it's been a year. Um, it feels like one long day, one, we have a colleague who calls it one long day, one long night. Um, and in the early days of the early days of any epidemic, any pandemic, um, it's about getting information and really understanding the extent of, of a virus or of a pathogen. Um, and you ask questions in the beginning, the, the same questions every time there's an emerging pathogen. What is it? Is it a virus? Is it a bacteria? Um, you know, how does it spread? Um, what disease does it cause? Uh, what is the extent of infection? And how do we how do we prevent it from spreading? How do we how do we limit the spread? And one of the ways in which we do this um, at WHO is we often have field missions to countries. Um, so the field mission to China wasn't anything new. I mean, we do this quite often. Um, I was part of the mission team that went to China in February, um, where our responsibility, we were part of this international team um, of amazing scientists and we had counterparts from, from China um, matched in, in almost every area of different types of technical discipline. And our goal was to really understand uh, what was happening in China in terms of transmission, in terms of the interventions that were put in place, in terms of the disease that was being seen, the treatments that were being used, um, the, the control measures, and to learn. Um, and so we could gather information, support China and anything that it needed um, to control spread to end the outbreak and to use that information to advise the world. So I was, I was there, um, we went in early February and I remember um, landing in Beijing, a normal, normally bustling airport and it was silent. It was really late at night and it was very dark. Um, and you know, we were all in masks. We, we could get off the plane without a mask. And it was a series of meetings and meetings and meetings and field visits. And it was really quite incredible to meet different people from, from many different cities across uh, China, from uh, ICU physicians to politicians, to community uh, health workers, um, nurses, doctors, patients, um, and people on the street. Uh, and learning what they understood about the virus um, and, and what their role was in ending, uh, reducing spread. And so our goal was to generate a report and share the information with the world and use that information to advise others on what to do in terms of finding cases and, and, and controlling the outbreak. So it was quite an intense, it was quite an intense trip. Um, and much of what we learned in China on that mission um, has been has held true in terms of our understanding of severity, uh, disease progression, the way the virus spreads. I'm looking at my map as I'm talking to you. Mm -hmm. uh, and other countries have replicated these actions, um, maybe not to the extent as we saw of the lockdown in Wuhan, um, but it's certainly in terms of individual level measures, community level measures, all of government, all of society type approach. Um, so there's a lot that we're still learning um, about, about this virus. I have a close friend who runs the commercial organization for Merck and is stationed in China. And he had mentioned to me, he was really back to work and, and his Merck commercial sales force was back to work really a few weeks after um, by the, the May, June timeframe, it was quite incredible. We have several questions from audience members who really want to get your opinion on the variants that we're seeing, but maybe before we go there, you could talk a little bit about how, you, how the WHO does specimen collection. I think it would be really important for the audience to understand that process um, to really talk about variants. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that process for us. Yeah, so it, it depends on the type of virus it is and where it's spreading. So most of the time, the emerging pathogens that we have, there's a spillover event from an animal to a human. Most of these viruses are, are zoonotic and they'll happen in a small geographic area. When you have a pandemic, um, and you have the virus in many different countries, um, it's, you know, countries have access to different viruses. They have access to samples that they can use to, to better study it. 
Um, what we do is we have a global lab network um, for many different types of pathogens, many different diseases. And these labs are set up to rapidly detect any new pathogens, um, look and run a panel of tests to determine if it's flu, if it's SARS, if it's MERS, if it's adenovirus, if it's Legionella, and if it's not, to look at you know, the sequencing of it to determine if it's something new. I'm oversimplifying this way, way too much, but um, what we do is WHO doesn't go out and collect specimens. We don't, we don't have you know, people who go out with a, with a you know, briefcase and, and, and collect specimens uh, like, we, like you see in the movies. What we do is we work with laboratories and we have partners all over the world and they do that. We work with um, ministries of health, ministries of agriculture to um, do rapid response investigations. And so when there is an event, um, you do these field investigations and, and samples are collected. They're sent to the lab and they're evaluated from animals, from humans. Um, and then we work with many labs around the world. For these virus variants, um, people around the world are, have been tracking the virus and the evolution of the virus. Um, viruses change, they mutate. Um, this is something that we expect. Uh, we've been tracking since January, in fact. Um, and there was a mutation that occurred, it was first identified in late January, early February called the D614G mutation. And that um, virus replaced other circulating SARS-CoV-2 viruses by June. We started seeing um, variants uh, identified in the United Kingdom. In, um, we were alerted to this in December um, and they picked up this virus variant called the variant of concern 2020-1201 or the B117 lineage. Um, they identified that because they noticed in their surveillance system that there was a change in transmission, an increase in transmission despite interventions in place. Um, and recognizing that something was out of the ordinary, they looked to, to check the, the sequence itself and noticed that this was um, a virus that had a number of mutations. There were other virus variants identified in South Africa called the 501YV2 um, vi oh. variant. And that was identified again um, by researchers who had increased sequencing surveillance um, and noticed a, a changes in the circulation as well and check. So it comes from um, good epidemiologic surveillance. It comes from se sequencing. Um, and we don't have great capacity for sequencing around the world. This is something that we're trying to improve. And when these variants are identified, the, we work with the countries to share these viruses with different labs so that further studies can be done. We do this through our SARS-CoV-2 lab network and also our virus evolution working group where we set up um, the exchange and the sharing of these samples between the host country and different partners. Um, whether these are academic labs, they could be manufacturers, they could be, there's a variety of ways in which the, the sequences can be shared. Um, but there's a process uh, by, which, by which we do this. Um, and we try to do it as quickly as we can. And we're also setting up what's known as a bio hub, um, which will be a lab in Switzerland, um, which will receive samples uh, and be able to process those samples to share. And this is something that is being newly established. It's not starting from scratch because we have a lot of labs around the world that support us in doing that, but this bio hub um, will receive vol voluntary samples from countries so that they can distribute it to others and we can take the burden off the individual countries. That's very interesting. The, I think we've gotten a lot of questions from the audience on your view on how we will deal with variants that we're seeing yesterday. Moderna, the, uh, the company that has one of the two vaccines on the market, talked about their vaccine's ability to protect against variants mm -hmm. a little bit weaker against the South African variant, but feel confident about a booster. Love to hear your perspective and the WHO perspective about new variants. What keeps you up at night? What, what do you think? Well, that's a, that's a really good question. I mean, it, there's a lot to unpack right there, but we have what we're trying to do is set up a framework, a risk assessment framework, so that we can track the virus changes and that we can detect them quickly and that we can study them, we can do the proper studies that need to be done for mutations, individual mutations, combinations of mutations, which we call variants of interest, and then further study on variants of concern. So through our Virus Evolution Working Group and our R&D, our Research and Development Blueprint, we have established a suite of studies, in vivo, in vitro studies that need to be done to evaluate transmission, transmissibility, to evaluate disease presentation and severity, 
and to evaluate any potential impacts on available and future diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. That's a way oversimplification of all the partners around the world that need to, to link into that to be able to carry out those studies. So what we're trying to do is set up this framework so that people understand that there's a robust process that need to be about, need to need to go through for each of these variants of concern because mutations happen all the time. And we live in a pandemic of press release and preprints and on the one hand, it's really wonderful to get you know, information in real time. On the other hand, we really need to properly assess them because headlines are very dramatic um, and we need to make sure we follow the science. So the good news for these virus variants that we are detecting, we're going to see more. There are more that are being detected in Brazil. Um, you have the, this P1, P2 lineage um, that we're worried about, but there will be others. So we need to make sure that we have a good framework to actually find them and, and identify them that we can study them uh, in the lab, but we can also evaluate the products. Um, I worry about changes in the virus because the more, op the more this virus circulates, the more opportunities it has to change. We're a year into this. The entire world is exhausted and frustrated. Um, they want it to be over. I want it to be over too. We have vaccines coming online. We cannot lose this war. Um, now that we have vaccines coming online. And I know people don't like us making the war analogy, but it feels very much like we're all sort of in the battle of our lives right now. Um, and the fight is against the virus. It should not be against each other, but it needs to be against this virus um, and making sure that we do everything we can to reduce infections. We should be preventing as many infections as we can, first and foremost. And we have the tools to do that now while vaccines are rolled out because it is gonna take some time for vaccines to actually reach um, all of the vulnerable people and, and frontline workers around the world. Well, there continues to be a flurry of great data, not only from the vaccine world, but the monoclonal antibody world as well. Our, our, our Cornellians want to know your view, will our lives go back to normal? What's, what's, your, what's your view, the WHO's view, when will our lives go back to normal? Well, will our lives go back to normal? Yes. When will our lives go back to normal is up to us. So, I mean, what, what encourages me as there are many countries around the world who are back to normal. Um, you know, if you look at many countries across Asia, across the Pacific, um, they are out and about, you know, they are able to go back to a new normal. And I think we need to think about that new normal because I think there are a lot of things that we need to be improving in our daily lives. Um, the way we live our lives, you know, how we spend our time, um, what we're doing to this planet. Um, so for me, I, I seek encouragement. Um, and it's why I have a hopeful attitude that we can get through this. And we definitely will get through this because we've seen countries do it even without vaccination. Um, now with vaccination, another incredibly powerful tool, we have therapeutics coming online. We can do much more to prevent infections and, and save people from dealing with severe disease and dying. I mean, if you think of, of North America, if you think of, of Europe, um, we've seen countries across Europe bring transmission down to single digits. Um, and now we're seeing, even with these virus variants that are circulating, we're seeing incidents reduce. The question is, how do we suppress transmission while opening up? That needs to be done very, very carefully. And we need to see how countries start to open up again, not do it too quickly, so that, it does, that the virus doesn't rebound. Um, and people are tired. So we need to really understand barriers to compliance with a lot of these measures that are in place. And quite frankly, many of these um, interventions are an inconvenience in many parts of the world where you're told to stay home um, in all countries. You know, this has a significant impact for people who make their daily wage by going to work. So it's easy for me to say, follow the intervention, stay home if you're unwell, stay home if there are stay at home orders, but governments need to support people in doing so. So it's a long winded answer to say um, that we will get there. I have no doubt that we will get there. Um, when is up to us. Maria, would you uh, help us understand herd immunity a little bit more? Um, when do you think herd immunity will have an impact to our lives in the U.S.? What's, what's the importance of herd immunity? We'd love to get your, your thoughts and, and, and the WHO's view on herd immunity. Yeah, so there's different ways you can reach herd immunity or population level immunity. One is through natural infection, 
But normally when we talk about herd immunity, we normally talk about it in the presence of vaccination, how much of the population needs to be vaccinated so that it protects the rest of the population that perhaps can't get that vaccine. Um, if we look at natural infection, um, we measure this through seroprevalence studies. Um, and there are hundreds of seroprevalence studies that are going on around the world, hundreds. It, it is remarkable. Um, the way that science has been accelerated um, in this pandemic is remarkable. Um, we've never seen anything like it before. And that started with the, the sharing of the sequence um, in early January. But these seroprevalence studies are telling us that the majority of the world's population remains susceptible. Mm. If you look at individual studies, most of them were, collected, were done using samples collected in the spring and the summer in the Northern Hemisphere. We have very few with, with data from November, December. They're not yet published. But they tell us that less than 10% of the, of the population studied have evidence of past infection me as measured by these antibodies. It's higher in higher risk populations, you know, health workers, frontline workers, and then some high intense areas have higher seroprevalence. But in terms of the vaccine um, providing immunity or providing protection, we're still learning about how long natural infection and immunity lasts and also from the vaccine. Um, but given the, the priority of vaccination in, in most countries and what it should be is focusing on vulnerable populations and frontline workers. Because our goal right now with vaccination is to reduce severe disease amongst those who are most vulnerable for, for, getting, for developing severe disease and protecting our frontline workers. And what we are doing through our COVAX initiative is, which was launched in April, is to make sure that there's vaccines that are available to the vulnerable people and frontline workers in all countries, as opposed to vaccine for everyone in a few countries. We really need, there's an ethical dilemma right now that we have. We need to make sure that frontline workers in lower income countries are vaccinated before low risk individuals in high income countries get that vaccine. So it's, it's a challenge that we have ahead, but that relates to your question of how long will we reach until we reach herd immunity. So it depends on the, the strategy. It depends on when the vaccines, and it's really quite incredible that we also have multiple vaccines. It's not just one and we have more in development. So when those become available, protection becomes uh, increases and that we, we roll it out and that vaccination programs actually start um, in country. Well, I'm certainly hopeful as we vaccinate high-risk populations in the U.S., we'll see a significant change in death rates and hospitalizations and morbidity and mortality. It's, it's really quite incredible. I want to turn it over to uh, David, uh, my son and a recent Cornell grad, has a few questions representing the Cornell undergraduate and graduate community. David, I'm going to turn it over to you for your first question. All right. Uh, thanks, Bria, again, for taking time out of your assuredly quite busy schedule. I know for me, as someone who's a prospective kind of global health uh, kind of future uh, practitioner, that I know that hearing from someone in the field is really inspiring to me, especially as the pandemic has really thrust global health um, onto the world stage. Um, so kind of my first big question is really kind of about uh, kind of reopening in the college um, campus environment. So Cornell has received a lot of positive publicity for their um, ability to bring back students and have so, and reintroduce restricted in-person learning. However, it's really clear that Cornell really has a plethora of resources that it has allowed them to do it um, with uh, relative success. So what advice do you have for college communities that don't have the same level of resources that Cornell um, does that could allow them to potentially um, uh, re, uh, uh, bring in students um, in person and potentially um, restart some um, in-person learning opportunities. Thanks, David, and congratulations on your graduation. Um, good luck on uh, making your choice for your for your yeah. next your next degree. Um, thanks for bringing up um, Cornell and and opening up because I I did read those articles and I I actually tweeted those to promote those because I was really impressed by the comprehensive nature in which Cornell approached this. Um, your your question is about lower income and not having the same level of resources, but I think what Cornell did. Um, and many universities are doing this, it's about a combination of interventions. 
it isn't one thing at all. There, there's sometimes is, a, is an over-reliance on testing or an over-reliance on masks or an over-reliance on pick, pick one of the interventions. But I think what we're seeing in, in successful universities around the world and even, even schools for, for younger, for adolescents uh, and children is about how you open them up safely. Um, in-person learning for all ages is critically important, especially for the youngest, youngest kids. But I think this combination of physical distancing and masks, and there was a reduction in, in size. We've seen class sizes or, or they, they stagger the students. Um, the testing, um, and so that you know where the virus is, I mean, that's kind of one of the fundamental aspects of understanding um, control is good testing, good reliable testing with rapid results. Testing for testing's sake with no results is useless. But testing with results and knowing what to do linked to public health action is really what can break chains of transmission. Um, so countries are, are using physical distancing, they're staggering students, um, they're doing a combination of in-person and online. Um, we've seen some use outdoor um, classrooms, you know, uh, instead of indoor classrooms, um, you know, looking at ventilation systems within schools, opening windows, um, lots of different things. So I don't think, I think we have seen success in high income and in low income. And, and you remind me of one point that I would really like to make is countries that have done really well, areas, territories, countries that have done really well, have had experience with past infectious diseases like SARS, like MERS, like Ebola. In many countries across Asia, many countries across Africa um, may not have the highest income uh, may not have the most resources, but they've used the resources that they have strategically. They've used them wisely. Um, they can do, they have community workers. And that combination of factors with that muscle memory from something previous, applying it to the current situation, being strategic with the use of the resources that they have um, has controlled transmission. Um, and the quicker you can control transmission, the quicker you can get back to what will become our new normal and getting schools and getting schools open. Um, so the other thing is, I think in, in low income countries, schools and universities are part of the community. If you can control transmission in the community, you're controlling transmission in the schools. They're not an isolated bubble. They're part of the, the community in which we all live. Thank, thank you for that really, really great answer. And I've definitely seen um, when I was at Cornell and during the fall, the different measures and really how they definitely had an impact on the, the amount of cases that we saw um, during the semester. So really my last question. Right. May I say one thing also I, I was impressed with Cornell is that the students were part of the solution. And that is one of the most important aspects of any intervention is an empowered and informed and engaged population. And I remember reading articles about the student body saying like, we want the schools to be open. We want to be part of the solution. So, you know, and, and taking that collective accountability. That was also really impressive uh, at Cornell. Yeah, I agree. I definitely think it's really important because at the end of the day, those are the, not only individuals that have the highest likelihood of actually being affected by the policy, but they probably have the biggest stake in kind of the university's opening um, at the end of the day. So really um, kind of my last question is I know that kind of as someone who's studying global health, I know that kind of there we get, there's so many variety of issues that affect like all different populations across the globe. And I know that kind of the, pan, the pandemic has really been on everybody's mind, but uh, I think it's really also important to kind of look to the future and what also potentially things that may emerge. So kind of for the next generation of scientists and people working in the global health um, in the field, um, kind of where do you think that we, um, could make the most difference or kind of where do you think that kind of global health as a space kind of will maybe move past on um, the current pandemic? It's a, it's a great question. It's a tough question. Um, I mean, I think as you embark on your studies further in your career, um, you will learn about what you like to do and what you don't like to do. Finding out what you don't like to do is just as important as finding out what you do like to do. But it's about experience and as much experience as you can get, um, especially with populations and in countries that you want to be working in, do that. You know, follow the opportunities that you are that you will have uh, and work your tail off on on trying to learn and absorb as, as much as you can. 
Um, I think what I'm seeing in the next, you know, in, in, in upcoming classes in the next generation of this is that there's a much more broad multidisciplinary focus instead of, you know, you have to have your specialty and you have to understand, you know, what that is, but there's much more collaboration. Um, you know, we think of this in the one health space. Um, we are better prepared than we were last year, but we need to use this experience to further that preparedness so that we have better surveillance in animals and at the animal human interface, whatever. But, I, but on that one health approach, we're seeing students that are coming out of programs that have not only been taught human health, they've also been taught animal health. But as much as you can in your, um, as much as you can, reach out to other disciplines and work cross collaboratively because the question that somebody else poses from a different discipline will make you think differently. Um, and I think the innovation that you have, um, the fact that, you know, <laughs> we, need, we need new ideas. We need to think out of the box because clearly um, the generation, the generations that have gotten us into this place, something needs to change. Um, and I think we need the next generation uh, to really challenge everything that we do and how we do it um, because there's a lot of room for improvement. Thank you. I think that's definitely something that we need to take in um, kind of as we move into the space. So I'd um, like to go back to my dad who has some more questions on behalf um, of the members of the alumni community. Thanks, Thanks David. David. And uh, Maria, we have about 10 minutes left. So I thought I'd jump a little bit uh, uh, ask you a, 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 some specific questions around the WHO. Maybe where you left it with David, you know, how do you think this will, this pandemic changes the way the WHO will think about future threats uh, to our society? Just curious what your view is now that this has passed and how your organization might, might behave or react differently. Yeah, well, we're not quite past it yet. We're still kind of in the thick of it. So there's a lot. What we try to do is we always are, are looking at the lessons and incorporating them into where we are so that we, we use those. We don't wait till it ends to, to make those corrections. And that everyone is doing that and everyone needs to be doing that. And I think that's a positive thing. I think that's a growth thing. What, I, what we would like to see and what we need to do is more on the preparedness side. Um, we go from a, a, a system of urgency and neglect, urgency and neglect, you know, based on the latest threat. But these are constant health security threats, these viruses, these pathogens that have this potential. And if we could invest much more in preparedness um, in terms of getting systems in place, workforces in place, surveillance up, um, we would be in a better position to detect things earlier. We have changed the way in which we track alerts um, and signals around the world, where we have this electronic uh, system called our EIOS, our uh, Epidemiologic Intelligence from Open Sources, where we are trolling um, digital um, rumors um, and signals, thousands per month, which we follow up on, which would require a detailed discussion, which we have every morning, we discuss these alerts. Um, some of which require field visits, you know, to go in and ask these questions and verify and collect samples. Um, some of them require uh, full investigations where we, you know, operate our incident management structure, which is what we did for, for this novel coronavirus, this cluster of unknown etiology uh, in Wuhan on the 1st of January last year. Um, and all of that can happen faster. You know, it's all about having good systems in countries to be able to, to, to detect these alerts. Um, and so we're working to make sure that that happens, that happens quicker, but that was improving, that was in place before. Our director general, when he took office in 2017, established a division for preparedness. So in my health emergency, not my health, in the health emergencies program that I'm in, which is led by Dr. Mike Ryan, who's brilliant. We have two divisions. We have the preparedness division and the response division. And we work together because it's a continuum about making sure that we're supporting countries in through in our international health regulations, through our joint external evaluations, making sure that they are prepared um, for whatever it is that may come from anything from the animal side, all the way through digital systems, through public health law. There's a lot to do. 
Um, and it's not simple because if it were just a public health issue, um, we wouldn't be in a situation like this. It needs to involve all of government, all of society. So there's laws and treaties being discussed and you know, we're moving in the right direction. Um, but these types of events need to propel us to not start from scratch, but to build on really strong networks and partners that we have around the world to enhance that, to engage um, even, even stronger. So there's a lot that's going on in this space, um, but it's all about how each of us act and how countries um, use this information to make their systems better. Well, it, that's remarkable. I think I have one time for one more question. M many of the Cornellians out there were, was really, they were curious to know with all of the, of the change and the craziness that 2020 brought us, how did the WHO's relationship with the United States change and how did the, the positions that the US took in 2020 really affect the WHO? It'd be great if you can share some, some thoughts without getting too political. Well, I'm an American, as you know. Um, we, we at WHO have worked with Americans for decades. I mean, just decades. And um, I'm a scientist, I'm on the technical team. So we have um, Americans as part of our technical networks from USCDC, NIH, from academic institutions who are collaborating with us um, on the R&D side, everything. That never changed, never changed, no matter, no matter what. And we, that would continue no matter what, you know, uh, on the politics side. We, we try to keep our solely focused on the job at hand which is understanding the science, consolidating evidence into guidance, guidance into policy and policy into action. Um, and that doesn't change. I mean, certainly um, things are different now um, and we are seeing more engagement. Um, it was hard for me, I would have to say over the last year, it's been quite a challenging year in many, many different aspects. Um, we're grateful for um, the US not following through on their withdrawal. Um, and we're looking forward to even more um, engagement with, with our partners. I mean, we work with scientists all over the world, um, no matter what the politics in any part of the world, because our goal is to keep the world safe. So we will work with anyone anywhere, um, no matter what, and that's not going to change anytime soon. That's great. Maybe I'll squeeze in one more last question. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what it, what what has to happen for the WHO to make a recommendation either for a treatment or a preventative measure? That'd be great to hear a little bit about that process. So it's a pretty large process. So we, what we do is we uh, get our hands on every shred of evidence that exists for any particular question. And usually when you ask a question, there's many questions within that. We do the literature reviews and uh, if it's a novel pathogen, there's no studies on any of it. So we look to similar pathogens um, and we uh, pull together published literature, preprints, um, gray literature um, for treatments. It's really important that um, you assess and we, we do this for all areas, but you have to assess the quality of the study. So not all studies are the same quality, even published studies, even in high impact journals, um, they don't have all the same quality. So we have a process by which we grade each of the papers. And we work with international networks and guideline development groups, um, which are made up of expertise uh, around the world. We have good representation around the world with different types of technical backgrounds. We look at conflicts of interest because we need people to make independent assessments. Then we discuss, 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 debate, debate, debate. Um, and we turn those, that evidence into recommendations. For on the clinical side, we put these into conditional recommendations or strong recommendations or weak recommendations. Um, and we outline these in guidance documents, um, which are published on our website. And for the clinical management guidance, it's also for specific treatments, it's also published in peer, re peer reviewed journals as well. Um, and you know, there are we look at the clinical trials and, and we also, for this pandemic, what we've been doing are these prospective meta-analyses. So led by Dr. Janet Diaz, also another American, who's leading our clinical team, um, because there's so many clinical trials all, all over the world, many of them have small sample sizes. So what we do is we reach out to the principal investigators and we work with them to pool the data as they are analyzing their individual studies. They work with us to share the data so that we could pool studies together 
and we try to publish at the same time. And so we can build a larger sample size to get to that answer quicker on efficacy, safety, et cetera. And all of that goes into guidance materials. It's an iterative process because by the time you publish something, there's more studies. So we start, we start again and we review again. And that's true for every single guidance material we have, whether it's for masks or it's for clinical management or it's for um, you know, markets or it's for um, everything. Uh, and so we are really grateful for our thousands of partners around the world um, who bring that together. Um, but one of the things on clinical side, which is really key in the beginning of a pandemic or beginning of an epidemic, is you have no you have no studies. So we we have these networks, and we have these teleconferences where we put clinician to clinician, nurse to nurse, you know, medical professional to medical professional on the phone together to say, in China, in Wuhan, what are you seeing? Together with scientists from Saudi Arabia who had MERS patients, together with uh, UK specialists who dealt with SARS. What are you seeing? What treatments are you trying? We're trying this for MERS. Here is our protocol. They sent the protocol from Saudi Arabia to Wuhan to say, you might want to try this research protocol called the Miracle Trial. And it's, it's about collaboration. So this is one of WHO's superpowers. You know, we may not be the lab people that go out and collect the samples in the field, but we can bring scientists together and accelerate science at, at, a, at a pace that is faster than any peer reviewed publication. I remember when this pandemic started and we had to wipe every surface and every bag had to sit outside for two days. So that was fantastic. The way the scientific community was able to say really not necessary, not a high risk. So that was, that was one practical uh, recommendation that I recall really being a life changer in, in our household for sure. Mm -hmm. I really want to thank you for your time. This is really interesting. Stephanie, I want to turn it back to you for any closing remarks or comments. Maria, thank you again. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Scott. And thank you, David. Um, and a big thank you to Maria. I was taking a lot of notes. And as a, always a student, a student of Cornell, I, I, I learned some new words. Zootonic. Is that, am I saying that right? Zootonic? Zootonic. Zootonic. Okay, thank yeah. you. Um, <laughs> but a few things that you talked about, I thought were really great themes. Um, one, just where you just ended talking about partnership and just the role that who plays and just the role that a partnership plays across countries, across corporations, across industry to really get us to the outcome that we need to get to. You talked about following the science and how important following the science is. And at the end, I think we'll leave everyone just with one last thing that you said is about remaining hopeful. And I think we wanted to thank you for continuing that hope and the work that you're doing at the World Health Organization. Um, I know we um, and our group of friends are excited to one day get on a plane and come visit you out in Switzerland and give you a big hug in person to thank you personally for everything that you do. Um, so thank you for your time. We know it's late in Geneva. We'll let you get home back to your family. We wanted, I really wanted to thank all the hundreds of guests we have, Cornellians we have on the line today. While we tried to cover as many questions as possible, there were so many great questions that came in. So thank you so much. Um, please do keep a lookout. There will be more, um, more engaging and continue more events from Cornell um, on this topic and others related to the pandemic and the COVID-19. So please do keep a lookout for what's coming out of Cornell. So with all that, I really wanna say a big thank you. Um, it was great having you here today. Um, I know everyone was so happy that we could hear from you and as such an expert in the cause. So thank you so much everyone and thank you for your time. <laughs>